introduce to you our host today, Susan Berger from the FAIC. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Mike. And uh, we'll get started here. I'll run through my slides quickly. Um, if Connecting to collections is a big program. And so if you look at our community website, you'll find that there are links to resources that are really designed for smaller institutions. Um, and there are, there's a discussion forum, which you need to register for, but it just takes a few minutes. And there are people that will answer your questions quickly. And there are over 120 webinars that are available in the archives. And now um, almost all of them have closed captioning. There's a link that will take you to the closed captioning um, on the webinar pages. And we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. If you want to be part of the Connecting to Collections announce list, um, you can uh, go to this website and join, and I will put you in. And that's just a list that is for announcements. It's not for discussions. And you can always contact me. This is my email address, and I'm happy to um, work with you and solve any problems. In January, we're going to have a, a, uh, a webinar on filmcare.org. And then in February, we're, we're going to have one on quilts. And so we look forward to you joining us for those. And uh, join us in the new year. We're going to have a lot of new webinars, one on oversized uh, papers, one on, uh, there's going to be one on outdoor sculpture. There's going to be a course or two on legal issues. There's going to be a short course on exhibits. So lots of things are coming up. And so uh, join us in the New York year and have a happy uh, end of year season. And now I'm going to turn you over to Rachel Ehrenstein and our steam. And uh, we'll get her started. Rachel? Thank you, Susan. Can everyone, can you hear me okay, Susan, before I start off? Yeah. Okay. Um, good afternoon to everyone. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to update the webinar I did on this topic in 2012 because the technology of these products is changing quickly and the question of what equipment is best for monitoring collections is one that we see frequently on various forums and listservs. Let me take a moment to tell you a bit about my background so you'll have a sense of where I'm coming from. I became interested in this topic during my first job in the Anthropology Department's Conservation Lab at the American Museum of Natural History, where I was in charge of monitoring exhibit spaces, including the incredible dioramas. We had old equipment that was failing, and I was tasked with researching what new equipment to buy. I became frustrated pretty quickly because it was hard to understand and compare the specification sheets for different products as each company used different te terminology. But by the end of the project, I not only made my choice of new logger, but I had the text for what became the first National Park Service conservagram leaflet on data loggers. That experience led to a real interest in the unglamorous task of preventive conservation as the most efficient way to prevent deterioration. After taking some HVAC engineering classes, I fully embraced my geeky love of gadgets. In my private conservation practice, I performed treatments for museums, small and large, and also set up monitoring programs and advise on environmental improvements. So over the years, I've had experience picking monitoring equipment for institutions with wildly varied resources. I would also like to mention that in the last few years, my partner in crime has been conservator Samantha Alderson at the American Museum of Natural History. Together, we updated the conservagram a few years ago. We've given workshops on the topic, and we stay in touch with vendors to keep abreast of the new products that might benefit our field. So that's enough about me. If you want to know more or contact me, you can check out the handout for today's program. So here's what I plan on covering in the next hour, leaving time for questions at the end. Because the core audience for the Connecting to Collections Care webinars are small or under-resourced museums, I want to give some introductory background information on why monitoring is useful and the broader context of what our options are. 
But then I'm going to focus on understanding the technology and terminology of wireless monitors. This can get technical, but it's important to have at least a familiarity with the terms so that you understand what, um, what and how the products work. Next, I'll talk about some of the products that I think are good options for our field. And at the end, I'll touch on some guidelines for monitoring that I'm frequently asked about and don't change no matter what equipment you'll be using. These days, I generally don't have to convince institutions that they should be monitoring. Staff at museums, historic homes, libraries, and archives know that the environment in which we store and exhibit our collections has a direct effect on their long-term preservation. But it's worth reviewing the ways in which environmental data can be used no matter how large or small you are. The data you collect is important in understanding the conditions to which your collections have become acclimated. Then you can predict how they'll react when those conditions are changed or how items will age if conditions remain the same. Having data on your spaces will allow you to make smart decisions on where you store your pieces, even if you're choosing between not ideal options. The data will help you analyze how well your building envelope is acting as the first line of defense in protecting collections, and if you have them, whether your air handling units are performing to the best of their ability. Data is powerful in supporting fundraising efforts to show that you're addressing a documented need, whether it be for large projects like upgrading HVAC or small, like purchasing boxes to buffer collections. If you're interested in cutting costs or being ecologically sustainable, then you really need this data. There are other parameters that can be measured and might factor into decision making on the environment. There are loggers that will look at light intensity and or accumulation. You can also track activity in a space, opening or closing of doors and other variables. But today we're going to focus on temperature and relative humidity, or RH. A few of the loggers that we'll be looking at today are able to monitor other parameters, and I'll try to mention that. But the information is in the spec sheets, whose links are given in the handout. But let's remember that the goal in monitoring is to have data to actually use. What we're talking about today is just a means to an end. I hope this program will allow you to spend less time in choosing a logger to not get overwhelmed by the variety of options out there because you know, they, there's a reason why we tend to come back to you know, some of the same companies and some of the same products. So I hope this will allow you to spend less time in choosing the logger and less time gathering your data so that ultimately you have more time to analyze it and use it to affect positive change. In other words, the data should serve to help you manage your environment which is a continuous and ongoing project. So I want to very briefly review the range of equipment so you have a more complete understanding of your options and where the products we'll be focusing on today fit in. We're going to be mostly looking at the, the sort of more advanced spectrum. And I'm not sure that these are really the best option for small or under-resourced museums but we often get a range of viewers on our webinars. And so um, we're going to go through the, the whole thing. But first, I want to ask a few questions to you guys, the audience. Susan, can you put out poll questions number one and two? OK. Well, this is great. I can already see um, generally the poll questions I'm going to be asking today um, are similar to the ones that, um, that we asked four years ago. So um, at the end of the program, it'll be interesting to, to see how the data compares. Um, but already, I think we're seeing you know, certainly that there's more people who are using standalone um, data loggers um, and fewer who just aren't sure are still using hydrothermal. And pretty much almost everyone is monitoring, so that's great. Thanks, Susan. OK, we're going to start low tech. Hygrometers are devices for measuring humidity. And thermohygrometers measure temperature and RH, 
are low-tech options, and they still have a place for certain applications. There are analog versions like this dial type on top, or digital versions like the one shown in the middle. The example on the bottom is called an R10, and it's still popular in museums because it has a redundancy check with the humidity strip down below to help you determine if the dials are accurate. These units tend to be cheap and of variable accuracy. The analog version, like the dial and R10 units, can often be used or calibrated. But they only provide a spot check, meaning they don't record or log anything, although the digital versions sometimes record high or low readings. They can be useful for applications like putting in a buffered vitrine so that you know when it's time to recondition your silica gel. A step up from the hygrometer is the Hyger thermograph, which some of you are still using. Um, and I assume that the rest of you are familiar with. Why can't I continue to use my Hyger thermograph is something I hear less of these days. But the short answer is that you can. Hyger thermographs remain available, and providing that they're properly cared for can provide years of yeoman service with relatively little effort. Hyger thermographs should be calibrated regularly, meaning weekly or monthly, depending on when you change the paper charts, since they move out of calibration quickly. But this is easy to do with an aspirating psychrometer seen in the lower image. As everyone moves towards data loggers, so, it's getting harder to find the paper charts and pens to use with the Hyger thermographs. Mostly the downside is that it doesn't allow you to easily analyze your data statistically to get a sense of the big picture. It's like the difference between a flip phone and a smartphone. It can do the job, but it doesn't give you all the groovy features that you know are now available. I can't really recommend hygrothermographs anymore, given how easy and cheap data loggers are these days. At the other end of the technological spectrum, we have building management systems, or BMSs. A BMS is a computer-based system that controls and monitors the building's mechanical and, engine and electrical equipment, such as ventilation, lighting, power, fire, and security systems. Building management systems are most common in larger buildings, and they're critical, a critical component to managing energy demand. Improperly configured BMS systems are believed to account for 20% of building energy use. So this is a screenshot of one type of BMS view, showing what's going on in part of a system. Some BMSs can log the data, but it often takes a lot of memory and slows the system down, so facility staff often don't like doing it. Additionally, the BMS sensors are placed to allow it to monitor its own system and its own performance. So having an independent check, one that you can control where the data is being collected, can be valuable. If you're a conservator, a collection manager, a curator, a registrar, ultimately your job isn't to run the system, but to work with the facility staff who run the system to ensure that it's performing to meet the needs of your collection. If you don't have a facility staff and you're at an institution that's small and you're doing it all, you're not going to have a BMS, so it's not an issue. So while the BMS can log and analyze data, and this might be necessary if you're addressing a specific problem, even if you have one, this won't be a good long-term solution for most of you. So that brings us to the monitor of choice these days, the data logger. Data logger is a general name for a battery-powered device with a sensor and microprocessor that will record information. For our purposes, at a minimum, this includes temperature and RH, but as I mentioned before, also can include some other parameters. I'm interested to see why people might be looking to change their monitoring equipment. Susan, can you pull up poll three? Give everyone a minute. It seems there's a portion of our audience that is looking to, you know, replace equipment. Um, but the actual act of downloading um, and the time-consuming nature of that is definitely um, the primary driver for people who are looking to, to move to 
wireless system. Okay. So here's where it starts to get a little complicated. If you look at these loggers in the picture, there aren't any wires sticking out. In fact, they are wireless, at least while they're logging. With standalone loggers, each logger works independently, and you have to download the data to view the results. There are different ways in which you can download the data, and this flowchart sort of tries to, to outline this. So you have um, a direct connection, meaning something like a USB port um, or a cradle or cable that connects your logger to the computer. So an example of this would be one of the onset um, hobo units. You can have an indirect connection, um, something that transports the data between the logger and your computer, such as a handheld, a unit, or an SD card, or a flash drive, um, like we see with the PEM2. And then we get into wireless. So this is where the logger communicates with an intermediary device, like a handheld, um, or a smartphone or tablet, and then that information is transferred either to your desktop PC or up to the cloud. And we're going to discuss some of those units today, but these are still sort of standalone units. They each work independently, and they're not communicating with each other. The opposite of a standalone logger is a connected system. Connected systems are often mislabeled as wireless loggers, but this is a misnomer in two ways. Not all of these sensors are logging and storing information. Ideally, they should, because if you have a power outage or something else goes wrong, you want to make sure that um, the unit has the ability to store information so it doesn't get lost. But some merely sense the information and then relay it to the nearest collection point. Also, these systems can be wireless, or they can be hardwired into your Ethernet. Before I start talking about the different ways that data can be transmitted wirelessly, I want to talk about some of the features um, that is important to understand. And I think I actually am going to skip ahead to this slide here and come back. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because much of it's covered in the conservagram. Um, but there are both hardware and software considerations that you need um, to know about and choosing a product. If you want a more detailed explanation of these parameters, you can listen to the 2012 Connecting to Collections online community webinar that I gave on choosing a data logger. It's available in the, in the site archives. For the connected systems, some of the parameters that are in the conservagram are still important, namely those in the left of the slide. And the ones um, in the center may be less so. Um, and the one on the right is in a new one. So I want to run through a few of these because even though they'll continue to change, the, the products themselves will continue to change, the information is important in evaluating systems, whether the ones we'll look at today or things that are going to come out you know, in, the, in the next couple of months or the next year. So first, I want to make sure that people pay attention to the operating range. This is the range of temperature and RH over which the logger will work. Generally, most sensors, sensors function over a temperature range beyond what we expect to see in our collection environments. Remember, a lot of wireless monitoring is for the food or pharmaceutical industry, um, and they have you know, parameters way outside what we expect to see. But you do sometimes have to pay close attention to the RH range. For instance, the T and D log EC has an RH operating range of 15 to 90%. And if you're monitoring in a case of archaeological metals, or you're in the southwest where conditions are extremely dry, that may not go low enough to capture the bottom end of your data. I get questions a lot on accuracy. Um, and you need to know that your data is accurate. And some of the products are calibrated more carefully than others. But all of the products that I'll be mentioning today are, are acceptable for our purposes. And remember, if you aren't checking the accuracy of the equipment you're already using at least every couple of years, then you can't have faith in the accuracy of your data. Some of the units considered here have replaceable sensors. Some can be self-calibrated. 
but most need to be sent back to the manufacturer for calibration. And this is an expense that you have to build into your maintenance budget. Power source and battery life is important, um, and especially so for the connected systems and the wireless loggers. You have to pay attention to the battery life to ensure that you'll have enough power for your project. For wireless loggers, you need the battery both for sampling and for transmitting, so it you know, remains crucial. Anything, I think, under one year um, at a reasonable sampling and transmission rate should be a unit that you reconsider. And remember that some of the systems have a receiver that will need to be plugged into a power source. So that's going to influence its placement. Alarms are a really important function of wireless systems. And the ability to get real-time notification of problematic conditions can be great, or it can be a burden. Systems now have various ways to indicate an alarm condition, including the LCD display itself, um, audible alarms, but mostly people are looking to get either emails or texts. If you don't have the staff or an environmental system that you can make changes based on these notifications, this may not be so valuable to you. But then you need to ask yourself whether you really need real-time data. And then I want to skip to transmission. Transmission is a new parameter to look for in wireless logger specifications. When manufacturers give transmission distance, they're generally talking line of sight. So if they say 300 feet, they're talking about like an open field or a parking lot. Once you start putting walls, metal storage cabinets, concrete floors, and other things in the way, that number greatly diminishes. So as I discuss the technology that loggers use, you'll see how that affects transmission. But you can always assume it's going to be less than what is listed. Um, I've felt in the past that there are you know, some uh, units where the software can sort of make or break the, the user friendliness. And the list of software considerations is sort of personal, and it can you know, be long. But you want to consider the both the initial cost and time and effort to retrieve the data and to get it into its proper analysis platform. Sometimes the software is a separate expense. Sometimes now it's bundled in and free with the logger. But um, you're also going to now to start to need to consider whether you prefer to have an upfront cost or whether you are willing to pay for an ongoing subscription service. So some of the things that you'll want to um, think about are the data retrieval issues. For instance, you know, is it a cable? Is it wireless? Is it a flash drive? Um, the formats for data and graphs, um, whether you, know, you prefer your, your data in a CSV format or you really want um, you know, text, or you're, you're happy to have the proprietary format of, of the um, software package you're using. Um, I didn't mean to skip software platform compatibility. Uh, you need to know what you're using in your lab. Are you on Mac or PC platforms? Um, and now, with the option to download to tablets or phones, whether you're on um, iOS or Android. Um, there's a lot of data viewing and analysis options. And um, these tend to be sort of personal, what colors, how the graph prints out, whether um, you are able to modify the graph, so to modify um, your axes and um, the, you know, the numbers you're seeing and whether you can add viewable target data ranges. So these are just some of the things to, to think about when you look. And very often now, it's, this is something that the loggers um, companies have vastly improved. You can sometimes download um, demos uh, or screenshots. There's videos. So you can actually find out a lot more about the logger software before you actually purchase a unit. OK, so let's jump back quickly to um, costs. Um, the loggers that we're going to be discussing today um, range in cost from $70 um, up to $900. But some of them are part of systems that the sort of basic price is around $3,000. And then you're adding on sensors from there. But 
it's important to understand that there's a reason why loggers are priced the way they are. Um, generally, you're getting what you pay for. Uh, and so you can't expect an inexpensive product to perform the same as a high-end one. Um, and that's OK. There are uses for both ends of the spectrum. So if you're priced out of some of these you know, snazzier systems, you know, not to worry. There's probably a logger um, or a, even a, now um, a connected system that will meet your needs. But you have to think carefully over the long-term costs over the life of the logger. Um, and you don't want to be penny wise or pound foolish. You know, if you're you know, thinking about what your staff use of time is, how you're using the data, you know, those are costs as well. So now let's jump back to talking about some technology. So we had the flowchart up and we could see that our direct and indirect connection loggers don't really count as wireless because you do need to physically touch those loggers to get your data. So we're going to count those, you know, as as just the standalone data loggers. And while you know it's not always um, correct, we're going to um, use the term wireless for things that you don't actually have to to handle to get the data off of. But Next, I want to discuss the word cloud. Cloud means um, shared computing resources on demand, rather than using local servers or devices to handle the applications. When we say the cloud, we generally mean internet-based computing for storage and applications. Units like the PEM2 store information in the cloud, but according to our definition just a minute ago, it's not wireless. So you see where we start to get some overlap. Four years ago, when I did the last webinar on this topic, none of the wireless loggers actually uploaded directly to the cloud. We knew it was coming, and now it's here. So this is the really big change in the landscape. Several products now do communicate directly with the cloud storage system, but you have to look carefully at whether there are extra or ongoing costs with this service. The next term we'll see on the spec sheets is Wi-Fi, something that most of us can no longer live without. It's the most common wireless networking technology using radio waves to provide wireless network connections. And we're going to talk about several Wi-Fi loggers today. But it's important to know what kind of Wi-Fi system you have in your museum and whether that system really reaches all the places that you're going to want to monitor. You have to know whether you have an open network or one that's password protected. Next, we want to talk about networking. A network is a group of two or more computer systems linked together. There are many types of networks, but the term that you'll see most frequently in this context is LAN, a local area network, which basically means that the computers are in some geographic proximity, for instance, in the same building. A network protocol defines the signals that computers on your LAN use to communicate. And one of the most popular protocols for LAN is called Ethernet. So when we start to look at some of the systems, you'll see that they're either Wi-Fi or Ethernet, and some can do both. Some loggers are RF, um, which stands for radio frequency. RF is any frequency within the electromagnetic spectrum associated with radio wave propagation. Many wireless technologies are based on this. And <laughs> this image here is a graphic of how radio frequencies are allocated in the US by the FCC. As you can see, it's a mess. Some frequencies are open, others aren't. And this is really just important to understand because the frequency on which an RF logger transmits determines some, you know, all sorts of things of, you know, how powerful it is um, and, you know, how far you can throw your signal. It also will determine whether the system requires a site license or not. The next technology that we're going to um, see in some of the units to, um, today is Bluetooth. 
This is a short range radio technology aimed at simplifying communications between devices. There are different classes of Bluetooth transmission. Um, some, like class 1 devices, like a laptop, need more power but transmit longer distances. The most common devices are class 2, which require less power but transmit only around 30 feet. And that's, again, probably line of sight. In order for two devices to communicate using Bluetooth, they must be paired. Some of you have probably had Bluetooth headsets or headphones, and now you know cars allow you um, to connect to your phone via Bluetooth. Um, Bluetooth is sometimes referred to as a near-field communication, and they're similar but not the same. NFC has a transmission distance of only a few inches. One example is um, these new payment types where you can like tap your phone on the payment um, unit, but um, sometimes it does require some contact or at least just being a few inches away. It doesn't require pairing and it loses, um, uses little power. So this is just something to keep in mind as you read spec sheets. There are different cellular, digital cellular technologies, and you may see terms like GSM or others that I won't go into, but the con in the context of data loggers, refers to products that can transmit over a cellular phone network. These systems will require that you have a SIM card and a phone plan, just like with a cell phone. This quickly adds up to an uh, ongoing expense, and these systems probably aren't the right fit for our field with the range of other options that we have now. Infrared is a term that most of us know about relating to the portion of the light spectrum. Um, it's another way of referring to the IRDA standard for transmitting data via infrared light waves. You need to have the sending and receiving units in close proximity and direct line of sight to each other. There were a few loggers that used this technology and it was really the first way that logger companies tried to transmit wirelessly but it is outdated for our purposes, and I'm not going to be discussing any units that function this way. But you still see them out there, so I wanted to mention it. And then there are some RFID loggers, which stands for Radio Frequency Identification. It's similar in theory to barcode identification. With RFID, the electromagnetic and or electrostatic coupling in the RF portion of the electromagnetic spectrum is used to transmit signals. The RFID system consists of an antenna and a transceiver, which reads the radio frequency and transfers the information to a processing device and a transponder or tag, which contains the integrated RF circuitry and information to be transmitted. Phew. Don't worry. This technology is best suited for monitoring things on the move, whether it's your dog, sweaters in a store, or in our field, art in transit. There is one logger from Monarch that uses this technology, and I included links in the handout. But it, unless you really need the geolocating feature, it isn't really a good choice for the kinds of basic monitoring we do most often. There is also a company, eProvenance, that provides a monitoring service for fine art, um, although their specialty is really wine in transit, um, and they're using RFID trackers. So it's something at least to know about if the need should arise. So before I start talking about the actual products, I want to emphasize again that this is a selective list. There are ones that either I or my colleague Samantha or others whom we know have direct experience with. I've checked details with manufacturers and distributors for accuracy, but remember that the products and pricing change. The handout that I made to accompany the webinar lists the products by vendor and gives um, links to the appropriate web pages for easy access to the technical specifications. But here I'm going to talk about the loggers by connectivity type. So let's first talk about the Wi-Fi loggers. This is um, some of the, the units that form part of the T&D Corporation's RTR 500 C series. This is a really robust family of loggers that has by far the most connectivity options in a single product line. You can connect directly via the USB cable as a simple option. 
Um, on the bottom left, you're seeing a handheld unit, which is good for mobile or drive-by or walk-in data collection. The units can be networked into your institution's LAN using either the wired Ethernet connector or the Wi-Fi router, depending on the nature of your network. And there's even a cellular option. So we've used basically all of our terminology here. The system's good transmission rate and flexibility goes hand in hand, though, with a higher cost. But you can have your data either on your own network or use their free cloud storage. T&D only sells through distributors that have good tech support, and their US president is very familiar with our field and its needs. The RTR 574 um, logger, which is part of this line, is the only unit that logs UV and one of the more accurate Lux loggers. The units have always been good quality in my experience, and the software has improved greatly over time. This is a good option for mid to large institutions with a complex building, varied needs, and a good IT department. The temperature and RH sensors run um, between $249 to $319, depending on whether you're going for the um, regular or high accuracy sensor. Um, the Illuminance UV temperature and humidity um, logger is up at 370. And then you need one of the collection tools, either the handheld, which is also around 319, or the Ethernet or Wi-Fi base stations, which is 259. Again, the software and the cloud storage is free. So this is a really big system, but um, TND has said that actually their number one seller these days is this newer TR7 series. So there's two versions of the logger. The WF works over, the, over a wireless system, meaning that you need to know your SSID and password to connect. And the NF connects directly to your Ethernet system. So here you have to understand you know, which of these two systems is going to work in your building. While you can store your data locally using the mobile apps, the unit is pre-programmed to interact with TND's free unlimited cloud storage. So these units have both varying networking and data options depending on your building and your data sharing needs. There's no limit to the number of units you can have on the system, and there are some nice hardware features like a two-year battery life, internal memory, large LCD, and uh, one that I particularly like, which is the replaceable sensors. The sensor cost has come down recently to $259, making it competitively priced, especially when you add in the free storage. I think this is a good option for institutions that don't have the need or capabilities for the 500 series, but you still have to have a robust network that reaches all the areas that you want to monitor. The Testo Severus 2 logger is a newer one to the market. They exhibited at the last AIC meeting. And in playing around with it, I've been impressed with the ease of setup. There were a few things that I didn't find intuitive in their online software, but a call to their support staff cleared things up. The software allows you to group your units in different ways, making it easy to manage data for a large number of loggers. The reports look nice, and the app worked well on both the iPad, Android, and um, web platforms. I set up the alert functions to send text messages, and that also works smoothly. The loggers must be on a secure system, so it won't work on an open Wi-Fi network. While Gaylord Archival sells the other standalone loggers made by Testo, um, for now, you have to buy the Severus 2 directly from Testo. Their website for this is currently a bit um, clunky and, and unclear, but if you use the Request Info button, you'll get a quick response. Um, I found that the company was, has been very responsive, and um, they are you know, interested in selling directly now because um, they're willing to sort of look at bundling packages. They'll also do um, special orders like custom probes. The um, Severus 2 HI, which is the temperature and humidity logger, sells for about $316. But in contrast to the T&D, there are additional costs. You have to register the units, and the basic license is free, but your data is stored online only for three months, 
meaning that you must have a good plan for backing up and archiving your data on your local server or PC. If you purchase the advanced license, it's $16, uh, sorry, $17.60 per device per year, which can quickly add up for a mid-sized institution. This will give you two years of data storage, so the long-term archiving of data isn't an issue that goes away. I like the hardware and software, so it'll be interesting to see how it does in the market with its higher ongoing costs. Next, we'll take a look at the LASCAR ELYFI-TH and the TH+, Plus, which is essentially the same with um, the TH+, Plus has a uh, um, tighter RH uh, accuracy. This unit was released just weeks before the 2012 webinar. My first experience um, with this logger, I had trouble getting it set up in the smaller institution where I was working in Jerusalem. It just wasn't working well with my network, even after extensive technical support. But eventually, um, it, it was unclear whether it was the network or the unit itself, and a replacement unit um, was much easier to set up and the connectivity was much better. So when the unit first came out, um, you had you connected directly to a PC um, via the wireless uh, system, but now um, you can continue to do that, or you can use their cloud storage, um, cloud software called Files Through the Air. It's free for one to two units, um, but you don't have the full functionality that you get with a paid subscription service, and most of the things that we would want to do as museums or libraries and archives in terms of sharing our data um, require the subscription service. So this ongoing cost is something that museums often seem to balk at um, as opposed to upfront. So it's something to consider. Um, I found the the um, sort of dashboard of sensors, you know, nice and pleasant to use. <coughs> Excuse me, um, and their graphing software is good. So those are my favorites in the Wi-Fi category. Let's jump over now to Bluetooth. I've had a generally good experience with the um, Onset MX1101 Bluetooth logger. Initially, when I first used this logger a few years ago, I had some connectivity issues, and my Android phone wasn't new enough for the app. So this brings up an issue of you know, what um, handheld devices are we using are we using our personal devices? Are we using um, institutional sponsored devices? And making sure that you know that as these um, platforms and um, products and software uh, updates seem to come faster and faster, that um, keeping up with that is going to be an issue that you're going to have to pay attention to. The setup for the Bluetooth logger was very easy on the iOS platform, and on the right. Um, what you're seeing is uh, a setup of one logger that went in with, um, this is uh, a, um, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls that was um, in a, going to go into a sealed between, um, which had very strict environmental and reporting parameters. Initially, I found that the battery life of the units was well under one year, which um, was a drag for the um, uses that, that I needed it for in terms of uh, sealed vitrines for loan objects that we were not supposed to open. But um, this problem seems to have been corrected. It was a, um, a data power issue. And at $135, um, the price for this uh, logger is, is really very reasonable. The data does not go to the cloud. So someone needs to walk by the case to download it. Um, but it's easy to export and share the data. And you can see here, um, this is on my phone, what um, the little graph looks like. It's, um, you have to remind yourself not to be alarmed because it does an auto scaling. So um, you're not looking at this on a 0 to 100. Um, you're looking at you know, a tighter band. So when you see all of this up and down, it may not be actually that dramatic when you look at the numbers. But um, it's easy to sort of check on your, your sensors and see alarms. 
and um, it, there's a number of different options for how you can share your data. My understanding is that Onset is working on developing a cloud capability for the logger, so stay tuned for that. I haven't had the chance to play with this new Bluetooth logger from Lascar, but I do like their other products. Each unit costs 160, so I'm interested to see how it compares with the slightly cheaper Onset unit. Um, and it is important to know that, um, at least for now, the app is only available on Android devices. Um, T&D apparently um, is going to have um, a Bluetooth logger coming out, expected in early 2017. Um, it sh is supposed to be called the GR4 series. Um, that's at least the tip that I um, received. So that's just something to, to keep a lookout for. So now we're going to jump over to look at a few um, radio uh, loggers. Before wireless systems became cheaper and more common, Hanwell basically had a lock on the market for a while with their radio telemetry system. Many institutions in the US and UK have installed the system, but its main drawback was the need to beam the data from the sensors to a single PC-based collection point, which often required the use of numerous repeater units to extend the signal. Now, this system has a good signal strength due to the transmission frequency, but it does require a site-specific license. The newer Smart Receiver 2 wirelessly gathers the radio data from each transmitter in the building, saves it, and if it's connected to your institution's LAN, passes the data on as requested to the server. PCs on the LAN network can view the live or historical data as needed. The Hanwell sensors um, tend to be physically larger than a lot of the other loggers that um, we've looked at, but they do also have a USB option, and they're pretty robust and they have very long battery lives. In addition to monitoring temp and RH, there's other compatible units to measure light, UV, dust accumulation, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and more. So again, this is a very, um, it's a big system that can do a lot if, uh, if you're looking for, you know, lots of data options. However, the basic starter package, which includes the smart receiver, um, the Synergy software and the FCC site license come out to be $30,000. And then on top of that, you add the cost of the ML4000 RHT Humidity Series sensors, which are about $650 each. And if you need any additional receivers or repeaters, you're looking at an additional $1,400 of cost for each unit. So whether you get a second receiver or the repeaters depends on the most efficient way to increase your signal area. Anvil is now a product of the IMC group in the UK, and there are a couple of products like the GPRS cellular version of the system and the smaller sensor called the RF bug that are only available in the UK. So you may see those online, um, but they're not options for us here in the US. This is an established product, so there's a long track record, but um, they may not be as responsive as some of these other companies are to the needs of individual clients. Their U.S. distributor, though, understands the system well and works with the client to complete the installation. The LTEC Gen 2 wireless logging system is similar in some ways to the Hanwell system, and both are widely used in the U.K. LTEC entered the U.S. market far later than Hanwell. And the sensors transmit via radio frequency back to a single point receiver. The system is somewhat expensive to set up, but it may be worth the price for larger institutions with a complex plan, as the signal strength is considered fairly good. However, what is billed as a 3,200 foot line of sight transmission is more realistically around 650 feet in a museum. So you have to look at their specifications carefully. The base station, which can connect to a PC or the internet, is $1,800. The basic software is free, but the more useful DARCA heritage software, which is really well designed, is $1,000. There are two types of sensors, one with an LCD 
at $468 and one without at $382. If repeaters are necessary to increase the transmission distance, they're about $850 each. So this, like the Hanwell, you can see there's sort of an initial base price of several thousand dollars before you start adding on the sensor. Um, but um, depending on the, if you don't have a wireless network um, that extends throughout your museum, this is the kind of you know, option that will work in a complex building. While I'm a fan of the onset products as they feel they're generally good value for their money, even when they have some flaws, um, and as a company, Onset has broad familiarity with our profession and good support. The Onset ZW indoor wireless system, also called the Data Nodes, was one of the first plug and play systems that I came across. The system works on your local network, but if the base computer is connected to the internet, you can configure the software um, to email or text alarms and send or save your data on your network. But one issue with the nodes is that they need to be plugged in, which limits its placement. And the battery on the unit is really for backup, not for continued use. Um, and the sensor does some logging, but it's really meant to tide you over in the event of a power outage until you can communicate again with your collection point. So it isn't an appropriate option for an enclosed space like a vitrine. You're better off there with something like the Bluetooth loggers. There are a number of institutions that are using this system successfully, and you can find that information on the 2012 webinar handout. So it comes up you know, when people mention it on various listservs, but, um, but I think even the staff that I've spoken with at Onset agrees that this system has been superseded by other items in this product line. On the same vein, there's this wireless logger from T&D, which was an early entry into the wireless market. The small logger communicated back to the wireless dongle that you see here on the left. Um, and that had to remain in your computer's USB port. It was really easy to set up, but there was little signal strength. This was somewhat compensated by the logger's ability to create a mesh network where each unit both sensed data and transmitted it onto your PC collection point. This means the more sensors you had on the system, the more robust it would be. But the system didn't have any alert capabilities, so the benefit of having the real-time data was somewhat lost. While the unit is still available, um, and it's you know cheap at $160 per sensor, um, and the software was free, um, you needed more of them to counter this um, problem of the short range. And the battery only lasted six months, which was too short for my liking. So um, again, you'll see this on the website. People you know, mention it, um, but I'd bypass this one for T&D's other offerings. I want to point out that in addition to the many good products already out there and the new ones that will inevitably come, there are options to create your own logging system. I was fascinated by the series of posts by registrar and blogger Angela Kipp on her experiments whipping up her own logger. But unless you revel in STEM or your institution has unique needs, um, this isn't going to be the way to go. In um, choosing you know, a system, you shouldn't forget some intangible things. Um, the service and technical support of the company is going to be important. Um, you have to keep in mind your own in-house capabilities and expertise and, you know, uh, if possible, your own time and sanity. So let's just talk a little bit about the reasons to use wireless or connected systems. Um, I, I do, um, I understand that people, you know, are looking at this and it's, the, you know, the wave of the future. but um, you know, everything has its pluses and, and minuses. So the, the circumstances that I think um, wireless or connected systems work best is when you really need the real-time data. It's super convenient to sit at your desk and click into your monitoring system to see what's going on. However, the main advantage of having real-time data is the ability to quickly learn of and respond to these problematic conditions. If you're in an institution without climate control, if you don't have the ability to make corrections, and so this real-time knowledge, while cool, doesn't actually advance your collection care, then you need to have another compelling reason to use a wireless system. Um, 
So what are some of those? Um, it may be that you have off-site locations that you need to monitor. Um, that would be a good rationale for wireless. Uh, if you have lots of data, the wireless systems don't need the cables or flash drives or portable devices. Um, and so you can, you know, you can save time by uh, not having to go around to your institution collecting the data. Um, and so, you know, that will help if you're monitoring a lot of data points. And by that, I mean, you know, more than, let's say, 20. But keep in mind that going around and um, checking on your loggers puts you into your spaces. And um, often you notice other things, something, you know, that's wet, something that's dirty. Um, and, you know, there is value to making sure that you're, you know, in your spaces um, feeling what your collections are feeling. Another um, valid use is enclosed spaces. One of the compelling reasons to monitor um, sealed microclimates was, you know, something um, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, where um, I wasn't allowed to open the case. Um, at the American Museum of uh, Natural History, one of the cases I had to monitor was that of um, Copper Man, a mineralized mummy of an ancient Chilean miner. Um, and this case was hermetically sealed. Um, and it would have um, been nice to have um, a better way to know when the silica gel needed to be reconditioned. So hmm, are you ready for a connected system? So let's see. Um, Susan, can you pull up? I think it's um, polls four through eight, maybe a, a couple of those at a time. Okay, so we're getting some interesting um, getting some in interesting information here. Uh, in terms of how many spaces or sensors people currently have, um, we sort of have an, an even spread um, with a lot of people in the sort of 4 to um, 20, but some and 20 above. Um, when I've uh, spoken, I've spoken actually to a couple of people recently who were saying, you know, you know, in a small institution they were, they had 30 monitoring points. And, um, you know, I just asked them to go back and sort of check and sort of see if they actually were really looking at their data. Were they getting similar profiles? Was it possible that they didn't really, you know, need to monitor ongoing in so many spaces that they could say, you know, now after a year or two of monitoring that, you know, this space pretty much follows, you know, the space adjacent or the space above, you know, with a, let's say, 2% change. Um, most people were seeing, do you have some ability to change or control the environment? Um, so this is interesting. In the past, um, price was always the um, the big driver for uh, data logger choice, and now we're seeing ease of use as the as the top. Um, again, for accuracy, I think all of the loggers that um, we're talking about today are well within you know the range of accuracy. Um, while we certainly know that there's a lot of um, under-resourced museums in the C2CC audience, it seems that today is a pretty tech-savvy uh, crew. Um, hmm. And it's encouraging to see that people are sharing their data, um, and especially that they're sharing it with facilities um, and their administrations. So that's great. Um, And for the most part, we're monitoring in our climate controlled areas, some in non, and within um, display cases or off-site storage. So um, a nice spread there. So um, this list is sort of some of the, the things that I think are important to um, consider, you know, if, if you're monitoring uh, a number of spaces, meaning that the savings in time um, would really be beneficial, that's good. Um, the budget for the, the 
wireless um, systems, um, you know, certainly the more robust ones are ones that allow you to um, transmit to all areas of your institution um, are definitely more expensive. The Bluetooth loggers on the on the lower end of the the budget scale. Um, and knowing that you have you know an IT person that you know can help you, especially if you're looking at some of the bigger systems, is really an, um, essential. Um, and one thing again to remember is um, these other ongoing costs and you know just the regular costs of um, updating platforms now and apps or mobile devices, um, the cloud storage, and all of these other things. Um, it's definitely more of an issue than with the single standalone loggers. So when we see problems with um, wireless or connected systems, they um, tend to fall in um, you know, sort of a few broad categories. The first is the building construction. Um, the key to some of these wireless systems is testing them in your building because your ability to configure a system and transmit data successfully will depend greatly on your building's construction. So in general, you're going to want to place units away from metal building elements, um, for instance, walls, floors, um, and stairs. Uh, concrete will <laughs> adversely affect your transmission. Um, it's uh, unavoidable in larger institutions, but it, um, it's one of the things if you're a smaller historic home that works in, to your benefit. You'll want to keep wireless loggers far away from other wireless devices like LANs or cordless phones. And you'll also want to keep them away from noise emitting sources um, like you know, um, fluorescent lamps. I highly recommend purchasing a single unit and testing it in your space. Um, you can speak to the manufacturer or distributor and explain that if it works for you, you'll buy more. But don't buy a lot of any wireless logger until you check that it works in your building or on your network. As far as IT support, these devices and systems are increasingly easy to plug and play. But since most of them require that they run over some type of network in your institution, it's imperative that you have the support and cooperation of your IT department. If you don't have an IT department, then you have to determine whether um, this is how you want to spend your time and energy. Because when they don't work, they can become a real time suck. Um, device compatibility is the next issue. I don't know about you all, but the number of devices I have in my family and the updates they need is, you know, is becoming exhausting. So you have to consider whether you're going to have the time and budget and interest in keeping your platforms and devices up to date and compatible. And another thing that a couple of the um, developers um, talked about with me is the um, mentioning to our audience about firmware updates. Firmware is software that's part of the read-only memory of a device. And a number of the units that I tested required firmware updates before I could begin or complete the logger setup and installation. If you purchase a logger from a vendor, you'll want to keep an eye out for the emails or other notifications about firmware updates to ensure that your device continues to run properly. And if you run into you know, problems with a unit that used to, to work and be compatible and now isn't, I'm checking to see whether there's a firmware update is one of the first things you should do. So just quickly, um, you know, people ask how many you know, monitors do we need? There's no magic number of monitors or locations. You need to monitor what, you know, to figure out what you need to know. Um, do you have preservation concerns? Is there a collection or object of significance? Are there microclimates? Do you have large spaces or multiple air handlers? Do you have um, existing building issues? So ultimately, you want to place the logger to get the data you need. Do you want your data to be representative of a, of a space or near a particularly significant collection item or to diagnose or confirm a suspected area with poor conditions? Um, so this is data from a pre-workshop survey that Samantha and I did. And I'm interested to see how this small sample matches our audience today. Can we have our final poll question, number nine? OK. So oh, 
you're right, that one was pulled up, so we have that. Um, and again, it was climate controlled. Terrific. So um, one thing I'd like to draw attention to is this excellent 1997 article, which is available on the COOL Conservation Online website. Um, so this piece by J.P. Brown and William Rose draws a distinction between two different kinds of monitoring. So they called it confirmatory monitoring, which is um, requires sort of low sensor density, low data volume, and permanently installed units for a long-term objective. So this kind of monitoring is aimed at ensuring general chronic problems of indoor climate are being controlled to the desired limits. And then there's investigative monitoring, which is generally more for a temporary installation. You may want more high, you know, high sensor density, portable units, um, a higher data volume, meaning you know, sampling at a shorter rate. Um, and the objective for this is shorter term. You're aiming to discover the source of a particular acute problem and generate appropriate solutions. So I think this is really important to, um, to think about your goals. You know, um, it may be that for, for something, something like, uh, for some kinds of monitoring, the confirmatory monitoring, something simple like a PEM2 is enough for that space. And for, you know, other spaces, um, you know, where you have, um, you know, more valuable uh, exhibits, you know, the, something like a wireless or connected system would be um, a better choice. Um, in terms of logger placement, um, whether it's wireless or networked, doesn't, you know, really change. Um, you're going to probably want your, your logger amidst your collections or in your display. Um, Generally, it's recommended sort of four to six feet from the floor, um, somewhere, uh, you know, the accessibility obviously is not an issue so much for um, when we don't actually have to touch it to get our data off. Um, and then unless you want to be looking at what your HVAC supply is bringing you, um, you don't want it up near a duct or against a window um, or heater in direct sunlight. And um, the last uh, tip is just to make sure that you still pay attention to data management. Um, you know, even if you're, uh, you're having the data coming back to you, um, you still need to, to be looking at it to have it be useful. Um, you you know, want to be looking you know, monthly or for the seasonal anomalies and make sure that you're backing it up, especially you know, even if you're using um, a cloud uh, storage option. So um, I'm going to stop here um, so that we have enough time for questions. Um, I'm grateful to um, all the, the vendors and um, distributors who, and colleagues who um, helped with information for this presentation. And um, Susan, I think we can take some questions. OK, do you want me to read them, or do you want them? Do you want to read them? Let's see. I can read them. So, OK, Why don't, okay. go ahead. So Rose Smart said, I have several remote, i.e. 7 kilometer away, storage environments to check on. Hope this might be help with collection data better and more easily. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, so I, I, as I said, I, I definitely think that having off-site storage, you know, a place that you're not at, is um, a good reason to have um, a system that uh, that goes up to up to the cloud, so you can access it from you know where you are. So again, you need to know what what is the capability of that um, that space. So is there a Wi-Fi system there? Is there um, an Ethernet system? Um, you know, it, a Bluetooth logger wouldn't be a good choice for that um, application because you would still have to go there um, to be close enough, you know, um, to, to download your data. So there you really need um, either, you know, a Wi-Fi or, or Ethernet um, system um, or, you know, a radio system but that still would have to get your data to the cloud. 
So however you're connect collecting um, for an off-site location, it's the ability to check your data from, you know, from the cloud that's going to be the most valuable for you. Okay. Um, Holly Chase said, where can I go for museum standards of RH uh, and temperature levels for collections that are a variety of media? And Bryn Bender suggested the new revision of the Park Service handout, which I, uh, our uh, museum handbook, and I'll put that into the resource list after we finish today. But do you have any other suggestions? Um, I, I, I do. I mean, this, this is an ongoing issue that people are still um, wrestling with. You know, this idea that, well, if we're not recommending, you know, 70 degrees plus or minus 2 or, and, you know, 50% plus or minus 5%, you know, what are we looking at? Um, and in fact, there's, there's uh, a number of good resources um, that sort of talk about, you know, where we are right now. And many of them are already linked off of the um, C2CC uh, resource page. I believe, Susan, it's the um, Managing the Environment page. Yeah, that's right. Um, so there's... Um, the AIC wiki has sort of a, a, a bit of a history on sort of why we are in, in you know, where we are. Um, but there's a number of other um, good resources that NEDCC has some. Um, a couple of those are listed on the, um, on the handout or on the resource page. So I'd start there because um, I think many of those are, are sort of the most accessible ones. OK. Um Kimberly Kwan has, is there any way of checking if we can get proper transmission for wireless data loggers before purchasing them? Is there a solution for getting proper transmission of difficult areas with little access to cellular or Wi-Fi signal? Um, so, so in terms of... Um, Getting, um, getting a sense of, you know, checking. It is possible, like, if you're interested in something like the um, T&D 7 um, series or the LASCAR EL Wi-Fi, you know, to purchase one. And sometimes if you call up um, the manufacturer or distributor and say, you know, if this doesn't work in my institution, can I return it? You know, they, they may say, you know, you can have 14 days or 30 days. Um, you know, with money back. So that's definitely something that um, that I encourage you to you know to reach out to them and you know and say uh, I'm I can't you know I, this is a lot of money for my institution. I need to know that it's going to work. Um, so I've I have found that um, a lot of places have been um, have have been open to that. Um, so in terms of getting data all the way back to a you know a a central receiver or up to the cloud, um, you're either looking at the sort of, you know, Wi-Fi or you're looking at the, the radio. So, you know, the radio um, loggers like the LTEC or the Hanwell are designed for, for institutions where you don't have um, the, you know, the Wi-Fi or the Ethernet. But, um, but again, you're you're paying a higher cost because essentially you're implementing that capability with you know with the system. Um, I'm not sure. Like again, if your if your goal is to get the the data to come back to you, the Bluetooth um, you know still requires you to go out. Although you know data collection is sort of fast and easy. Um, Blake R Rail. Um, asks how often do you need to replace each data logger? So this is a really interesting question because um, it's it's pretty um, uh, it's pretty um, logger specific uh, and um, 
and it's you know sometimes it's it's hard to know. Uh, for the last uh, month or so, I've had a wide variety of loggers um, in a couple of locations around my studio, um, and some of them all seem to be in agreement, and some of them are you know just teetering on the outside range of you know of um, the the um, accuracy specs. So. In terms of replacing a, a data logger, uh, you know, nowadays with the, the standalone loggers, like the really simple ones, some of them are considered um, disposable. Like the really cheap ones that are under even $70, you can't recalibrate them. They're good for one to two years, and then the manufacturer assumes that you will literally throw it away and buy a new one. Um, you know, we tend to like to recommend that people check the calibration on a yearly basis. I think if your environment isn't um, crazy, uh, and generally you can get away with, you know, a couple of years. The temperature on, on a digital logger is not going to shift so much, but the RH over time will drift. Um, and it tends to drift high. So um, if you see that your, you know, readings are are creeping up over time, um, that's that's the, the time to sort of take it out. Um, maybe check it against uh, another logger, check it um, in an environment that you know is stable. Um, it's, you know, some of the better loggers are more expensive, but that doesn't actually mean that they last longer. Sometimes the higher quality sensors are more sensitive and um, can go out of calibration a little bit faster. So, um, so, but you know, some of the things like it's one of the reasons I do like the feature on the T and D, where um, those sensors are sort of like plug into the base unit, so you can actually replace the sensor without having to replace the entire logger. Okay. So, I would say you know check it after a couple of years. But you know, some loggers can keep going. Like the PM2s are designed to, you know, run for five years. Um, they say before you to recalibrate them. So. Okay. Um, Nicole Prun had her question about Lascar. Uh, she said she'd wish that she'd heard this before she bought one. Um, and Nicole, if you didn't get it answered, tell me. Um, Michael Ingram says, we've had issues with data loggers on Wi-Fi interrupting service with other Wi-Fi networks. I think you mentioned this, uh, Rachel. Have you encountered yeah. this before? And do you have any recommendations for a workaround? Um, so yes, I have encountered this before. And you know, and it is uh, an issue. And um, it, it is important. So, you know, for instance, I mentioned that the Severus um, 2 will only work on a secure network, and other things um, seem to play better on um, open networks. And uh, again, it, it's uh, it's really hard um, to say for sure. It you know because it, it really just depends on your your building and, and what your network configurations are. Um, so. So I guess my questions would be, you know, are you seeing this in only, you know, one section of the building? Um, do you have a good sense of of what networks and equipment is, you know, also in that area, um, and whether there's someone, you know, in your institution who can sort of help you sort of survey your landscape and figure out, you know, what is interfering with each with each thing. But it is also one of the reasons why um, it's important that um, that most most of these connected um, sensors do have some actual logging and storage capability. So it means when there is like an interruption in service, they they will store it, the data, and then when it comes back online, it'll just sort of like dump it all back in. But it is frustrating when you go on and and you see this sort of like you know hole um, and you know. You, Think well. That's not, you know, that's not what I'm paying for. So, um, so you're you're not alone. This is something that happened. Um, and before we go on, I'll just um, quickly jump back to to Nicole's question. Um, the the last car loggers when Samantha and I did the update for the conservagram, we 
we were we were really pleasantly surprised by um, you know they, these USB loggers were really cheap, um, but they performed really well in the calibration tests that we did. Um, and so if you know if you're happy with how that's working for you, um, you know I I think it's it's generally a good product line. Um, so I don't I don't think you should feel bad about you know about your purchase. Um. I'm bringing over the evaluation, so please fill out the evaluation. They're very important to us. We look at them. We use them to help plan. So here it is. And um, the next question is, has anyone dealt with problems implementing Wi-Fi data loggers because of the museum's firewall restrictions? I think that goes along with the one before. Yes, although it's a it's a slightly different issue. Um, Michael's issue is sort of you know that there's sort of interference in the system, mm -hmm. but there are other institutions where, um, and this again is why it's really important to um, to collaborate with your your IT department. So, for instance, um, Samantha at, at Natural History cannot use any of these um, you know Wi-Fi loggers. Um, their firewall restrictions, you know, prohibit it. We've, you know, she's played with things using um, Hotspot, but um, but she uses a, a hardwired system um, because it's just it's um, it does not play nicely. So um, it, there have been, you know, improvements. Again, for for you, I may um, Bill recommend taking a look at the Severus two. Because it it requires um, that it's on a secure network, that may work better for you. But um, uh, this is where we, you know you get into the sort of site specific complexity. Okay. Um, let's see. Does anyone have any experience with a mono tag by edit tag? That is not a, anything that I've heard about. Okay. And here's a wonky question from John Jacobs. He says, do any of the software packages have algorithms that will automatically indicate maximum ranges for temperature and RH, ranges that uh, during any given 24-hour period? Um, yes. Yeah, so this is a good question. Um, and it's interesting because um, some of the alert and you know alarm functions on the loggers are pretty um, simple. It's sort of like you know you get a reading above um, you know whatever your upper limit range is, um, and uh, and you know or do you get it below? But um, but a number of the loggers, uh, in fact, many of them now. Um, when you set up what your sort of um, what your target range is, uh, you can also set up um, how sort of how fine-tuned do you want that to be? Like, do you if you get um, you can say, well, I only really want to be um, uh, alerted um, to an alarm condition if it's been that way for more than you know a half an hour. So it means that like the occasional Blip or thing, you know that that sort of um, anomalous reading isn't going to, you know, send you scurrying for your for your phone or back to your lab. Um, so you can either set it up by the number of data points, um, by the time that it's outside the the range, um, and um, sometimes the systems will tell you. Um, you know, they'll send you a text when it's outside the range, and it'll send you a text when it's back in, um, so that you know have to worry. So yes, actually, the software now really does allow you to sort of configure um, what are the parameters um, and how, how sensitive you need that to be. OK, so we have six more minutes. So I'm going to push you to get through with these all, and, or otherwise I'll make you answer them in writing. Um, That's fine. Brent Powell asks, which systems are best uh, alarm notification responses. Okay, so that goes along with with John's questions. Um, so 
you know, the ones that I'm most familiar with are like I I was um, pleased with the um, Severus two. Um, I've had good results with the um, the onset Bluetooth. I haven't played with the the last car Bluetooth. Um, the um, the last car EL Wi-Fi um, does do that, but again, you need you know to be using um, the files through the air, the paid subscription rather than the PC based. I think for the better results there. Um, and uh, for you know, I, I haven't um, played yet with the seven, um, the the uh, TND um, seven series, but um, given what I've seen of their software, um, I have high expectations for that. Okay. Uh, so off the top of my head, that's um, those is, are, are the ones. That I've seen. Is there a system that will integrate to a BMS system? Um, none of the ones that we've discussed here today, and again, I I think you know for what we want to be able to do with our data, um, you know, generally we're looking at you know a, at like a parallel system. Um, for the things that integrate into a BMS system, you're you're generally looking at um, sort of product specific things that are are compatible. So none of these. Um, None of these are, you know, are, are, are something like that. Okay. Um, how frequently do, da <clears throat> do data loggers have to be calibrated? Um, so I think we sort of uh, address that one again. You know, I think it depends how um, how often you move them around, how extreme your conditions are. Um, you know, I'd certainly encourage you to take a look at them. If not every year, then every couple of years. Um, you know, even if um, there there are ways to do that with, with um, saturated salt solutions. Samantha and I have um, had in progress a, a, a another conservagram um, that that we we really do need to figure finish up, which explains how to do that. But even if you have more than you know a couple of loggers, if you put them on the desk all next to each other and see as you know is one an outlier, that gives you a sense. You know, you can. Um, run a psychrometer, you know, alongside them. Okay. So we have a really good one. If we need a consultant to help us select a data logging system, do we hire a conservator, or are there other consultants who can help us work with our facilities department? Um, so that is a good question, and I think it sort of depends on um, the size and complexity. Um, it depends, like, do you, uh, um, in terms of selecting a data logger system, um, a conservator that, you know, works with these products um, would probably be able to do that. If you go with someone like um, an engineer, there, you know, are a couple of, um, you know, people in, in AIC who, you know, I've worked with who are, you know, mechanical engineers as well as, um, you know, or have architectural backgrounds, they can um, sometimes take it to the next level. Um, so they're going to, you know, not only set you up with a data logging system, but, you know, they'll be looking at your building envelope and other improvements. Um, but they may be even more expensive than a conservator. So, you know, I, I'd say start with the find a conservator um, feature on the AIC website. You can um, check off uh, uh, within the different specialties whether you're looking for someone with a preventive conservation background. Um, so, you know, if you've, you could, you know, look broadly for an object conservator or a textile conservator or someone else, but if they've checked off in their profile that um, they have a preventive conservation background, you know, then you can ask them what their experience is um, setting up, you know, systems. Um, you're looking for someone who's a geek, um, so. Okay, and we have one last question from uh, Cindy Opex. Um, do any of these work in ultra-cold environments such as inside uh, freezers? Yes, um, many of them do because um, many of these systems are designed um, to, you know, to work. We are, we are a very small market overall, and you know, a couple of these companies have made real efforts to um, 
understand our needs. It's sort of, you know, fun to see your logger in a high profile, you know, museum. But, you know, for the most part, it's, um, you know, food storage, food um, transport, pharmaceutical um, needs, which um, are the big uh, um, purchasers of this kind of equipment. So, um, so in fact, I, I'm not going to hazard, um, because I, <laughs> looking at all of this equipment, some of the numbers blend together. But Cindy, use the um, links in the handout, because many of these will will go down. And if not these, because these are, were sort of specifically chosen for general museum monitoring, um, there are, like Onset certainly has a line that's meant for, you know, weather stations um, and other, like, more um, actual environment monitoring. Um, so those products um, certainly are out there. They may, though, um, be uh, slightly different versions of products that, that we've discussed today. Okay, so that's all. I want to thank everybody. Uh, we'll see you in the new year at the end of January. And remember, there are always people on the website to answer questions. And um, please fill out the, the um, evaluation. And thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Mike. Okay. Thanks to both of you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.